All right. Hello again, and welcome to the Onstage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller, and with me again is arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Hey, Alex. It's going pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing good. It's uh, We're recording this on January 21st, which is, uh, you know, my birthday. Um, Happy birthday, Alex. Uh, thanks. It's one of those big ones. It seems like just yesterday I was in my 50s. and, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, But uh, you're only as old as you feel, and I feel like I'm 14 or something. I don't know. Um, so, uh, as anyway, as usual, we're going to take a look around, uh, at the latest shows in Colorado and as well as, you know, what's on stage now and what's coming up. Uh, and then later in the podcast, we have an interview that I did with Nancy Evans Bagley, who's recently formed Veritas Productions Company, just opened its first, first show, uh, School of Rock at the Pace Center in Parker. So, uh, we talked about that and sort of her path to, uh, you know, her theater journey and and how she came to uh, form this production company with her partner. Uh, So that's a really uh, fun conversation. And it's uh, all about a show that is up now, which we will talk about in a little bit as well. Um, Also want to mention, uh, we've been uh, compiling our big list for the very first onstage Colorado awards for theater excellence, the Oscars. Uh, So we're going to try and do a live stream next Sunday, January 28th at 7 p.m. That'll be on our Facebook page the Onstage Colorado Facebook page. And, uh, you know, Facebook is still good for some things. And, and be able to do a live stream, uh, you know, for free is a, is still, to me, an amazing technology, <laughs> if we can get it right. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I was reading I was reading up on it. I was like, there's definitely a few uh, hoops to jump through, but hopefully I can, we can figure it out. Um, well, so that'll, um, that'll be fun. And, and we'll be running through all of the awards on the, on the live stream. Alex, I, and Eric as Todd Fitzgerald, who is also another reviewer. So should be join us on the live stream, comment along. It should be a fun time. Yes, if you're a theater artist who's done good work uh, in 2023, you may get an award because we're doing we're doing a bunch of them. So it's not just like one for each. All right. Well, um, I know one of the things that uh, Tony you'd mentioned wanted to to talk about a little bit. We've been kicking around is and, and we've mentioned it before, but um, trigger warnings. Um, and as I was kind of researching it a little bit. Uh, I found, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff on, on, you know, on, uh, publications from the New York times to, uh, you know, uh, theater, a lot of theater, uh, trade pubs, things like that, talking about it. And there's, I don't know if there's a real consensus. I mean, some people think it's really, you know, it's helpful for people who, you know, they want to know if there's going to be a gunshot or, uh, you know, nudity or things like that. And then you've got people saying, this is ridiculous. We're supposed to be <laughs> surprised in, in theater. So, uh, you know, this, I think it came out of the, I don't know, the the increasing, you know, I don't know if it's it's kind of related to diversity, equity, inclusion things, or just being more sensitive to to people. And, uh, you know, I, there was a, the first story I, f- I found was around 2018, the New York Times actually led off uh, with a, about the Denver Center production of Viet Gone. And, uh, uh, and so they meant, you know, that was one of the first ones that uh, they, they flagged. And, uh, and so I'm just going to read a quote from uh, the managing director of Berkeley Repertory Theater, Susie Medak, who was quoted in the story saying, we have a generation coming of age that expects to be pr- protected from discomfort. And a lot of companies succumb to that. To me, it's a frustrating trend. What's the point of experiencing art if you don't expect to be satisfied? Um, and then, uh, Just recently in October, the great actor Ian McKellen was in a play that had a trigger warning, and he said it was ludicrous to have a warning for a play he was in and said, I quite like to be surprised by loud noises and outrageous behavior on stage, which uh, I think I share that sentiment. So what's your take? I think I I would generally agree with the take. Like, I, I don't necessarily think we need to be, like, warning people about, like, things that go bump in the night kind of thing. Like if that makes sense, like, or on the stage. Loud, like maybe just like, oh, so for, like things that are just like loud noises or like shock yelling or kind of things like that. However, I can understand a trigger warning for something like a, like a gunshot. If that is where, because people have a complex PTSD or something associated with that. So I can, I can understand a warning for something like that, but I, I definitely, I like I I'm with you in terms of I I think part of the fun of theater is that is being surprised and so I don't love if every single element is surprised I wouldn't have loved if like I just saw Truth Be Told uh, and there are some pretty intense conversations in that play and it gets very it gets very heated um, and but I'm glad I'm kind of glad that I just got to experience that raw uh, and go into it. Um, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's varying degrees, you know, if it is uh, a lot of violence or gunshots, you know, obviously there's, there's always going to be age, you know, warnings. You would think that somebody who's subject to PTSD would, mm-hmm. would probably, you know, want to ask or, or be aware that, that certain things could happen. But, uh, and I guess the other thing is like, for those of us who don't or aren't concerned about you know, being triggered or anything, is it really that big of a deal for us to endure seeing a sign? You know, it doesn't really affect me a whole lot to learn that there was going to be fog in the show or something like that. Of course, I, I mentioned this one before. One of my favorites from last year was uh, was the uh, uh, the Die Hard parody one where they mentioned one of the trigger warnings was that it could have included foot trauma, um, I think, which I thought was like, really? I, I don't think that was really necessary. Yes. Uh, another one I was going to mention was just like, you know, on, on the other end is like, I'm thinking of, yeah. like, the, of like a Christmas Carol, Marley pops out of the stage and it's a huge surprise. And it's one of the highlights of the, the first part of the show, this huge surprise and it's scary. And, you know, you don't want to be warned about that. Uh, do you? I don't know. And and most people are like, Oh my God, that scared the shit out of me are not saying it in a negative fashion that they they like it. You know, people like to be scared. So, you know, it's cool. It's a, yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, no, I I agree. I remember I I've been to the I've been to Christmas Carol twice now, and both times I was sitting next to to like these fam to families, and they after intermission I was talking with them, and they all of them singled out the Marley jump because it's just like a really it's very impactful. It's cool because you don't know it's coming, and so I think you you definitely do lose something. And although I I understand again, I I understand that we're not maybe the we are not the people we don't have we don't have a disability in that regard or something. So I can understand if somebody has that, maybe making it optional at a couple performances. And I know family does a really nice job of like for all of their shows, making it very inclusive for people like that with the lights that'll just come up so very subtly in the corner to illustrate that. So that's kind of a give and take, I guess. And like maybe making an option is totally is cool, but yeah. An option like if you would like to see the trigger warning, <laughs> press here, or here's the alternate program or something. Uh, yeah, or or alternate performances, like just making it uh, like one performance, like being like, okay, here is a. Uh, I've seen this at quite a few theater companies. They do for every every now and then, every every well, once or twice within the run, a sensory friendly production. And they do that yeah. in movie theaters as well too. And so I think that the, those kind of things make a lot of sense. Because then you're making the experience more accessible for folks who maybe would not have come out to the theater uh, in that regard. But um, I think at writ large, I, I do kind of like the allure of a surprising theater experience. Yeah, it does. It kind of ties into some of this broader trend of, you know, uh, the whole idea of people being snowflakes these days and like we're overprotected, like we're helicopter parents, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's. It's certainly helpful for some people. Uh, I don't really think it's it's that intrusive to the rest of us. So I would say that if you feel as a theater that you know that it, that it's appropriate, then by all means, you know, um, I wouldn't get too upset about it. Uh, another one that uh, I was thinking about was land acknowledgments, which is yeah. a, a different thing, but sort of like another thing that you would learn before the show oh, starts. Yes. And this is about like this is Ute or Arapaho uh, land or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that I haven't really talked to anybody about this. It's just kind of this thing that appeared a few years ago all of a sudden. Uh, and, and, you know, at a lot, a lot of theaters and not, not all theaters, but, uh, but some of them, um, and it's cool in a way, but you have to also wonder like, why is, why am I hearing this at the beginning of the, you know, of a theater show? And I would ask the same thing, like, why am I hearing the, the star spangled banner or, or whatever, right before a football game? How did that become a thing? Uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> things just become things for some part, some person thought it was a good idea and it caught on. Uh, and of course, there's no, there's no doubting that the you know uh, indigenous Americans were very poorly treated, and it's it's good to acknowledge that. But it's not as you said when we were before we started. It's not like they're going to say, and now we are going to give back the land, you know, or something like that. It's not happening. It's just like, well, there it is. Exactly. It definitely feels very like white guilty. If I'm being totally honest, um, uh-huh. every time you, it's very much feels more for like the people saying it more than for the actual right. like, indigenous people um, or yeah. anything. Cause I, I, it's, I get they're, they're not giving the land back. It's just like, we've got, we've got this theater now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a like, yeah. What next are you going to be like in the supermarket? And they say, Oh, by the way, you know, 
meat is on sale for X, Y, and Z. And this is Uteland. Did you know that? Um, but I don't know. You know, I was talking to my wife who's uh, she's worked in academ- academia and she said, you know, they hear it a lot at conferences and, and things like that. So it's not just in theaters. It's, it's, uh, it's all around, but I guess I would also, I would come down on the same side. It's like, look, it, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just there. Uh, you know, there might be some people on, of a more conservative political bent who are infuriated by that, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't know. It's a little bit of a tech glitch there, but we were talking about land acknowledgements. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if we have a conclusive uh, thing there, uh, but uh, I would say it also, it adds to, and, and we've talked about this before, is like pre-show stuff. Um, I'm of the opinion that when you walk mm-hmm. into the theater, uh, they can say, shut off your cell phones, the lights go down, the show starts, and anything else is fluff and uh, distraction. Um, and, and we saw a great example, or a real, a sort of a, a very long example of that the other night at uh, School of Rock, where the, I think it was like 15 minutes of blah, blah before the, the, you know, the curtain went up. Which, it was uh, 15 minutes, yeah. <laughs> Tony was timing it. So, uh, you know, um, and, and, you know, what they're saying is important, acknowledging, you know, but I've never seen, uh, you know, where they're acknowledging like, yeah, the, you know, the sound person and the light person. And it's like, I just don't think that's the place for that as, as worthy of, of credit as those people might be. So, um, but you know, that's, I, I don't think the audience was, was too upset about it. Everybody was kind of, it was a very enthusiastic crowd. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but for right now, we're going to take a, a quick break. And we, when we come back, we'll look around the state at all the live theater that's coming up here at the very end of January and a look into February. So stick around. We'll be right back. The On Stage Colorado podcast is supported by Town Hall Arts Center, whose production of Yearn Town runs January 26th through February 25th. The three-time Tony Award-winning musical comedy is set in a collapsing urban metropolis where a 20-year drought has led to a government-enforced ban on private toilets. The citizens must use public amenities owned and operated by an evil corporation that profits by charging admission to the most popular seat in the house, so to speak. A hero will rise, a revolution will be sparked, and an unlikely love story will unfold. Get tickets at townhallartscenter.org. The podcast is also sponsored by the Aurora Fox Art Center, where the Tony Award-winning comedy Art plays February 3rd through the 25th. In this fast-paced, biting comedy, longtime friendships are put to the test when an expensive white painting upends everyone's prior assumptions. Life choices are thrust to the forefront when criticism of the prized possession devolves into personal attacks and the airing of grievances. For tickets and information, go to auroraFoxArtCenter.org. Onstage Colorado is also grateful for support from the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, whose next show is What the Constitution Means to Me by Heidi Schreck. In this smart and timely comedy, Schreck resurrects her 15-year-old self who traveled the country competing in American Legion speech competitions to save money for college. Unearthing her perspective on the Constitution then and now, she delves into four generations of women in her family and how the founding document shaped their lives. The show plays in Denver January 26th through February 11th, and in Boulder May 3rd through 19th. Info and tickets at Betsy.org. Okay, welcome back to the On Stage Colorado podcast. It's time for our weekly peek into some of the shows you can see on stage right now around Colorado and things coming up. So some of the shows that we've recently reviewed on our site was uh, Eric was at uh, the second production of Newsies, which was at the Arts Hub of Lafayette. And it closes today. So, uh, but, you know, he, he thought they did a great job with it. It's, you know, it's just a popular a popular show that gets done a lot. And uh, if you haven't seen it, if you didn't see the Performance Now one or this one at the Arts Hub, uh, no doubt Newsies will be coming back around. <laughs> at some point, not too long, and then not too distant future, probably. And speaking of newsies, I was just at that performance now, performance of newsies last night, and it was like, like you mentioned in your review, it was it was very well done. Some new, some newer, younger actors, a couple like a couple little bit of technical glitches in there, but it was a it was a very solid production by Performance Now over in the Lakewood Cultural Center, and they they also close today so this is their they're about to do their final matinee but yep. yeah newsies is newsies is left town but it'll be back i'm sure um also at vintage theater through <laughs> february 18th is fun home which is a story about a, a funeral home family which uh, eric uh, Fitzgerald reviewed for us uh which uh, you know he's, he really liked it it's a it's a 
selling out like crazy, I guess, over at Vintage. Uh, but they did have a, a little glitch on Friday. They had to cancel that show. I don't know if it was a, an illness or what, but uh, so they just, they're adding another weekend. So um, so you can still have uh, time to get to um, that through February 18th, uh, or maybe it's even through the 25th. I'm not sure. You'll just check their website. Uh, we have a review of Sweat at Open Stage up in Fort Collins. That's running through February 10th. Our reviewer, Carrie Redman, really liked that one. And then uh, soon we'll have a review of Miner's Alley's Miner's Alley Playhouse's production of Misery, uh, which runs the 19th through February 11th. So looking forward to see what uh, he thought of that. Did, have you seen that one yet, Tony? I'm going to be going to see Misery this afternoon I'll, I'll ah. over at Miner's Alley. I have, I got a chance to sit down with uh, the director, the directorial team and the cast to chat about the show for a piece I did for Boulder Weekly, and they got all into the nitty-gritty. It's the same script as the guy who wrote the movie. Uh, it's a it's a really quick play. There's a lot of really fast scenes in succession, uh, and it's it, it gives a lot more screen uh, stage time to Annie's character, who's played by Emma Messenger. So... Uh, I'm really looking forward to checking that one out. Yeah, I'd really like to get up there and see that uh, as well because uh, yeah, Emma's amazing and the, and the other two cast members are great too, I'm sure. Also at Miner's Alley, starting January 27th and running through, through February 10th, and then again from March 9th through April 6th is uh, their first kids show of the new year in a their new space. It's called Amelia's Big Idea. It's an original piece, and I am going with my granddaughter, Lindsay. She's uh, eight and so she's the prime demo for that so i love i love being able to take uh, take my grandkids to these shows yeah. to get their take on it because uh, that's the important right they're the important critics uh, there so um and uh, let's talk about the big one uh, that opened this weekend school of rock at the pace center this is the very first production by veritas productions and i, I mentioned we're going to be talking to nancy evans begley uh, a little later here so we'll hear her take on it all but uh uh school of rock wow great uh, great show for uh, opening night you know it was a little lumpy in places they definitely had some sound issues they need to work through but man what a cast what a great cast and and just fantastic i mean it is a complex show with two live bands and all kinds of moving parts and i think they really they really nailed it yeah it's led by caleb reed who is uh playing dewey ben over there and he's uh, and he he's great in terms of his chemistry, particularly with the massive cast of children who are yes. flipping, they're singing, they're dancing, they are uh, they're also playing instruments live. So uh, it's really worth seeing the production to just see that dynamic play out on stage. Uh, and th- the rest of the show is very well done, pretty well done too. Uh, but the, the kids and, and and Caleb's relationship with them is. It's really well done. Yeah. You know, so of course this was the original film was with Jack Black, who was kind of more of a jerk, um, I would say, in a character. And, and I know that they they kind of kind of want to take this Dewey Finn in a little bit different direction. He's still, you know, a lunkhead who who's kind of uh, socially clueless yeah. in a lot of ways. Uh, but, you know, the thing that was the, the thing that's cool about the story is that, you know, he winds up inspiring these kids, even though he's he's basically using them. <laughs> um, and, you know, and they tell him at the end, it's like, we don't care. You you know, you really helped us come out of our shell or whatever. So uh, and, and some of the other key roles in this show, uh, one of them is the little precocious sort of Hermione Granger character named Summer. Uh, and this is played by a, a 10 year old Gabrielle. Uh, Gwek. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, she was fantastic. She's a, a wee slip of a, a of a lass. She's 10 years old. She's also a performant, uh, 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 you know, a, a really skilled acrobat or gymnast. And so she was doing a lot of the kids were doing in addition to the dancing, they were doing, you know, f- I don't know handsprings and all this, all this stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, the four members of the kid band. So you've got, you know, a bassist, a drummer, a guitarist, um, and keys and all four of them are very very talented musicians in their own right uh and so really fun to watch them on stage uh i'd also call out um oh uh, the woman who played the the school principal uh rosalie sarah metz was the actor and she was great and the, the her role in the in this production is a little bigger than it was in the movie i think and there's a little bit more of a love interest between her and dewey which is a little weird and um but uh you know she gets a she gets a solo and um a solo song and uh and so uh yeah great great all around i know i know you had some comments about the whole andro lloyd weberization of it what what was your take on that uh, my, the only comment in that regard is just that like there it's it's based off of the 2004 movie and there are a lot of songs already in that movie and right. they really don't like stick it to the man 
uh, is is here and they really don't change a lot of them like they're very much exactly how they are in the movie because they're great songs they're awesome right. they're really cool songs they're cool they're cool for the kids to perform and everything but andrew lloyd weber does add in a lot of like fluffy filler songs and i gotta be honest they were not my favorite uh uh-huh. there were the a lot of the a lot of the times there were only i really only thought that the uh kind of there was this one number where they added in all the kids at the start of the act two it's a brand new number and it was really fun to kind of kick it off the rest of the songs i could really take them or leave them and that's uh-huh. not a critique of the show of the this production that's more of a critique of the book and the songs itself uh but just prepare yourself there are some filler songs yeah yeah you know you've got this this story you've got they probably were like you know we need to add some more time to this to this thing and and uh you know they're not they're not bad songs they're just they maybe don't advance the story quite as much but the real the real stuff comes like towards the end of the second act when they you know the kids get up there and it's just a it's really stirring moment when they you know they start to they start to perform and like all the angry parents suddenly are proud of them and <laughs> all this very much of a hollywood ending so yeah school of rock is playing at the pace center through february 10th fantastic Fantastic production, highly recommend. Uh, you know, it's it's family friendly to some extent. There's definitely some stuff in there that uh, you know, if you're a more you know cautious or careful parent, or your kids are maybe under, I don't know, ten, eight or ten. I guess it, it depends. That you know, there's there's a few things in there that uh, you know, there's some like drug and booze references and, uh, and a couple of other things like that that I would think mostly would go over the kids kids heads but they're they're in there so just be triggered there's your trigger warning for school of rock <laughs> indeed um, I- yeah <laughs> Uh, also coming up uh, this uh, this coming week, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar for its 50th anniversary Broadway tour is coming through the Buell. Uh, we'll be there on Tuesday night, and I think it's five. It's right in five five uh, five days, five nights there at the Buell. If you want to check that out, great show. Another Andrew Lloyd Webber show, but uh, with no real filler. Those are those are all uh, pretty impactful uh, songs. Those are all stuff. bangers. There's yeah. <laughs> there's no fluff in Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> I, I can shade his I can shade his writing with School of Rock, but game has to recognize game. That's Jesus right. Christ Superstar. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> All right. And I know you're going to Cebolas. I don't know, I never know if I'm pronouncing this right. This is the show at the Denver Center. It's C E B O L L A S. And I feel like I heard a radio spot that pronounced it differently, uh, but uh, that's how it's spelled. Saboyas, I think I heard them say it. Anyway, that's running January 26th through March 10th. Uh, definitely want to check that out. Uh, we mentioned uh, last week, Clink Clink uh, is coming back for, from Two Cent Lion, another original play running at the People's Building in Aurora, January 27th through February 11th. And then the Catamounts are re- uh, coming back with their feed series of, uh, it's kind of like a food pairing with uh, um some I don't know some sort of this is an adjacent performance uh, of of sorts that's related to the theme of the of the the food and drink that they're serving. Uh, this, here's one coming up at the Arvada Center, another kids show, Year Without Frog and Toad, and I think you're uh, going to this one. What do you know about this show, Tony? I am. It's a musical. It's a it's adapting these classic characters of Frog and Toad. Uh, there's two actors who are playing the Frog and Toad, and then the rest of the cast uh, plays every other role in the show. It's a, I'm going to, I'll be seeing it on Wednesday. I was just talking to Rebecca Ortiz, who's one of the cast members in it, uh, at School of Rock, actually. And she was just telling me it's a romp. She's like, she's been having, they've been having a lot of fun putting it together. So excited to see, to go check out that children's show over the Arvada Center. All right. So that's a nice long run, January 23rd through May 17th. And they, they usually do a, a, quite a few shows every week and at, at all different times to accommodate families and I think school schedules and things like that. So plenty of opportunity there. Uh, you're in town is coming to Town Hall Arts Center. I will be at that one this coming Friday, I think. Uh, really looking forward to that. It's a fun musical that uh, I've heard a lot but haven't seen. So uh, looking forward to that one. Uh, and then another show that I think we're all looking forward to at uh, Betsy, What the Constitution Means to Me. Uh, you'll be at this one. This runs January 26th through February 11th uh, at the Savoy in Denver. And then mm-hmm. again, May 3rd through 9th at the Dairy in Boulder. So this is just an interesting thing that uh, that uh, Mark and, and Jess over there at Betsy have been doing where they're kind of splitting the theaters, which uh, I think is great, especially if you don't, you know, if you live in Denver uh, or Boulder, you don't have to travel to the other one uh, to see some of these shows. And they're both great venues. 
Uh, also, Betsy is doing Love Letters for Valentine's Day uh, on Valentine's Day. It's directed by Josh, Josh Hartwell, and it's got uh, Billy McBride and Jim Hunt in it. And so this is just a real popular show uh, from A.R. Gurney that, that a lot of theaters do. It's a very easy show to do because they're actually reading the letters, so there's not really a lot of memorization to it. But uh, it's a, I have to say I've never seen Love Letters, <laughs> so, but I know a lot of people really like it. Uh, so that one's uh, will be at the uh, – uh, at the dairy on Valentine's Day. Uh, also coming up is uh, at the uh, a new thing for Betsy is uh, they're starting to do some kids shows themselves. So they're doing a show called Mad Librarians. Uh, and again, it's a split theater thing. They're doing it January 27th through February 10th at the Savoy in Denver. And then coming back in May 4th through 18th at the dairy. Uh, and our uh, our reviewer, Jamisha, will be there with her son uh, on, uh, Feb- I think, February 3rd. So we'll have a review of that coming up. Uh, also on stage now or opening soon, uh, we mentioned this uh, secret comedy of women at Garner Galleria, and that runs all the way through February 28th. So if you want to gather your girlfriends and head out, that's a lot of fun for the for uh, for women to go to. It's it's geared towards women with all kinds of uh, jokes and gags and and relatable content that, uh, that I think uh, really is uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Adam's Mystery Playhouse is doing Flower Power Murder uh, through February 24th. Uh, Crimes of the Heart is at Cripple Creek's Butte Theater, January 19th through February 3rd. Um, and here, uh, Longmont Theater Company is doing I Hate Hamlet, uh, which is the Paul Rudnick play a comedy that's uh, that's very funny. Uh, Minders Alley did it last year. Uh, uh, but they, yep. uh, they had to reschedule their opening weekend. So they were going to open uh, this coming weekend, but they moved it to February 2nd. So it'll run through February 10th. Uh, and so they, it was interesting. They did a, an announcement on Facebook, but their website is not updated. So I would just say, and this is, but this happens uh, a fair amount, uh, and especially with COVID, you know, where theaters are still having, this is still going on. Uh, theaters really, uh, I just got to say, you know, you can put it out there on Facebook, but you got to have it on your website. And of course it's really, uh, you know, you probably want to reach out to as many places that you know of that you have put the show information out, including our site. You know, I will definitely update those things when I see them, but I don't always see them. So, uh, you know, and, and that includes like if you've got handbills out there. I mean, you know, it's just it's unfortunate and it's a pain. But, uh, yeah, you want to you want to freshen that information up. So. Uh, looking into February, Chicago is coming to the Buell, a big Broadway production of that. Are you going to go to that, Tony? I am, and there is a, a because there is another there's a Colorado boy in, in right. the ensemble there, Adolfo. He uh, is, in, and this is a, the 25th anniversary tour of Chicago. Uh, so just I, I'm a, I like I quite like Fosse. I I like his the stylized staccato movements and how and and all of it. So I'm look I like I'm I'm excited to see Chicago. I've only seen it. I've only seen the movie. And so this will be, my, I think, my first time seeing it on stage. Uh, another one coming up is from the Colorado B- Ballet is the Jekyll and Hyde. And I'm excited to announce that we have a new reviewer who's going to be starting. It. Her name is Alice Catterlin. And she's going to be covering that one. It'll be her first review. And we're excited to have her because she's a really experienced arts writer uh, who's covered a lot of dance and theater, uh, primarily in the Seattle area for publications like the Seattle Times and Seattle Post Intelligencer, uh, Crosscut, which is the Pacific Northwest news site, uh, comes with tons of experience. And she sees theater. Uh, you know, she's she's moved to Colorado a, a few years back, I uh, think. But she also she's the kind of person that goes to London and New York and D.C. and San Francisco to see dance and theater. So uh, she's even said, maybe I'll maybe I'll do some advance, uh, you know, for, especially for shows that are go- coming from those places to Denver. Uh, so uh, look forward to uh, to having Alice on 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 stage Colorado. That is why wow, I was just looking at her uh, before we hopped on. I was looking at her byline and some of her work. Uh, over at the Seattle Times, and she really she's a quite a prolific writer, and she's very got away got away with words. So I'm excited to check out to read a review of Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think she she doesn't pull punches either. So uh, step up your game out there <laughs> if you've got Alice Indeed. coming. Uh, at Firehouse Theater at the John Han, which performs at the John Han Theater in Denver, is the Nakarima Society uh, that runs February 3rd through March 2nd. Eric Fitzgerald will be at that one. Uh, Art starts up at the Aurora Fox, February 3rd through 25th. And I think uh, Eric's going to be at that one as well. Down in Colorado Springs at the Springs Ensemble Theater, they're doing uh, uh, one called Annapurna, February 
1st through 18th. This is a relationshipy two-hander set in the Colorado Rockies uh, by playwright Char White. Uh, and it does have a trigger warning about nudity and quote unquote adult situations. So watch out for that. Uh, Steve Martin's play Picasso at the La Pina Gilles will be at the stage door in Conifer February 2nd through 25th. Uh, so Betty Hart, our uh, good friend uh, and president of the Colorado Theater mm-hmm. Guild, is going to be returning in her one hander Acts of Faith at the Dairy in Boulder February 3rd through 18th. So this is a show that she did at the Aurora Fox last year. It's about a, a young woman mistaken for a prophet, um, and uh, I think it's I think it's uh, pretty funny. Did you see that last year when Betty was in it? I did. I I, I saw it over at the Fox, and I thought it was very well done in that space. It's a kind of it's it was in their smaller theater. It was very it felt very immersive, and so this production of the Dairy is. Uh, I was talking to this team last week, and uh, they're doing it in a very, it's its a di- very different space, it's not quite as immersive, but they're really trying to keep that audience engagement element, because it is, it's a one-woman show, uh, you kind of have to play with the audience, and so Betty was like, w- they're working with a new movement consultant out of, based out of California, to kind of like bring in some additional elements, and they've touched up, I believe they've touched up the script a little bit, and just really refined the direction over there uh, by Pesha Redneck, who's another co-artistic director also yeah. a good friend of the pod yeah so are you, are you doing a story about that for westward or boulder weekly uh for the for boulder weekly actually uh since it's over in the it's over in boulder county and at the dairy center uh that one's going to be for the for the weekly okay so keep an eye out for tony's story about that one if you want to know more about Acts of Faith. Uh, finally, just mentioned uh, in February, uh, Triumph of Love at Wheat Ridge Theater is a gender bending musical running February 2nd through 18th. Uh, I don't know much else about that one, so check it out on their website. Well, stand by for just a sec, and I'll have my interview with Nancy Evans Begley from Veritas Productions to talk about uh, that organization as well as their new production of School of Rock. So hang on. All right. Well, here we are. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast. This, uh, Nancy Bagley is here. She is uh, here to tell us about uh, her new production company, uh, Project, or I shouldn't even call it Project Veritas. That's a, a crazy uh, right wing organization. But just. Definitely not that. <laughs> Veritas Productions. Uh, and, uh, and I want to ask you, how did you pick that? What is, is that like Latin for truth or something like that? Yeah, or? it's Latin for truth. The truth is mighty and will prevail. Um, this was a thought process and a a common mutual agreement between my business partner and I and my best friend, Amy Condon. And we were thinking about like, what is, what does this mean to us? You know, what does our mission statement mean? What do we want to accomplish here? Because Amy's also from Parker. I'm from, from Parker. And, um, really having truth and transparency and open door policies and pulling back the curtain, pun intended, uh, Uh in this industry was where we ended up. And I happen to be a huge Harry Potter fan as well. And Veritas Serum is the truth serum. (laughs) Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. A little Easter (laughs) egg there. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we're going to talk about all about Veritas and just a little bit, but I wanted to back up just a a little, and I I love to ask people, uh, you know, what their, their arc uh, as a theater artist was. And a lot of people can identify like that first moment or that first show they saw or some, something that sparked their interest. Do you have one of those? Um, (laughs) many. Uh, I've been Uh on stage since I was three years old, starting as a dancer and going into musical theater and conservatory and and really um, learning multiple disciplines. I was a competition dancer for a number of years and then started taking voice lessons. And um, (laughs) it may sound silly, but when I was a toddler, my parents gave me a hat that said boss on it. (laughs) <laughs> and whether that was a brand for something. <laughs> um, it's just kind of stuck with me. And I think I've been kind of bossy since I was really little. And, uh, you know, if we follow Tina Fey and Amy Bossy Pollard, pants, yeah. Yeah, it's like I, I love bossy women. I think that they take control and have leadership skills. And, you know, I've tried to manifest that in a healthy way. So some of the interviews that I've done recently with um, – 
like Ray Bailey for our trailer and everything and things that Amy and I have talked about are how do we create an environment of exceptional theater here in Colorado so people don't feel like they have to move to New York City to do something that's groundbreaking? Um, Not to say that people shouldn't go to Broadway, not to say that people shouldn't go to New York, but how do we elevate what we're seeing here in a kind of semi-professional community theater, some equity and union houses environment that, that raises the bar. Um, And we've performed on the Parker arts stage for, well, since it opened. So it's, it's 13, almost 13 years at this point and have seen really exceptional performances. We've been a part of really exceptional performances, but the processes maybe haven't been that great. <laughs> and the pay maybe hasn't been that great. And um, we want to we wanna change that narrative organically, locally. So that's really been the arc <clears throat> starting as a performer here and kind of watching all the things happen and who's doing what thing and how can we fine tune, finesse and, and raise the bar. All right. And so um, what what is involved in starting a production company? There must be a million things you have to do. Do you have to get like an LLC or have you done yeah. any of that kind of businessy stuff and figure out, uh, you know, all yeah. those kinds of things? What So um, and also I want to ask, like, how would you compare that to starting, say, a, a, you know, a, a more standard theater company? Um, I mean, it's minus the building it's the same thing right (laughs) so uh and now of course when you have a facility then you're dealing with inspections and um you know safety and environmentals and everything and as you know just so you know i come from a a lending and business background so uh, i've worked in commercial and residential real estate on some level my entire career and theater so now i have this like project management numbers business small business I've, i've launched small businesses from the ground up um, and now I, I consult for mega sales organizations across the country in my day job. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, starting a theater company, it, it comes, you've got to start with a concept. And I feel like the, the most successful organizations that we see have a very clear mission statement. They have a very clear purpose. They know which demographic and which communities they want to serve. And uh, they have core values built in. And so that was a really big part of putting pen to paper initially with Veritas Productions and making sure that we knew what we wanted to do, why we were doing it. And we weren't just like, oh, we love theater. Yay, right. let's do a show. <laughs> um, and yeah, there are all of those logistics. So forming an LLC, getting with the Colorado Secretary of State, making sure we have an EIN number so we can pay taxes appropriately because we are a for-profit company. A lot of theater companies are not. We've chosen to be that way because we partner with nonprofits like Parker Arts. Um, So we get the best of both worlds. And um, then making sure we have standard operating procedures, codes of ethics, background checks. Uh, There's, you know, currently we're a single member LLC. I'm the only employee of the company, but we've got officers um, who are helping manage the day to day and understanding what their lanes look like. And then it's managing the money, managing the budget, managing the organization, getting insurance, because you have to make sure that you, you know, if somebody gets injured on stage, which happens more often than anything any of us would like to admit, more than that you we think, have huh? proper coverage in place. Um, and strangely, getting insurance for a theater company without a building attached to it is really hard. Um, ah. So that was something that we discovered much earlier in 2023 and were able to take care of it. But yeah, there's all sorts of business logistics. And I think, you know, we're, we're all such a bunch of loony creatives that are so beautiful and wonderful and magical, but not many of us have the business savvy as well. Right. So So true. Yeah. Um, I, I do pride myself on having both. Um, but yeah, so (laughs) having all the logistics in place and making sure we're hitting timelines and deadlines and covering all bases is, is kind of my lane. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's, you know, we, we hear lots of doom and gloom about theaters these days, the theaters closing or cutting back their seasons. And, and, uh, what makes you sort of bullish on theater that you wanted to start your own production company? 
I can't live without it. Uh-huh. I can't live without it. And I think other people feel the same way. Um, and we have to figure out a way to re-engage audiences post-COVID. Um, and we were starting to see a decline in ticket sales and audience and, and patronage um, pre-COVID, but then COVID really put obviously a stopper in everything. And people figured out how to live differently through that pandemic. And so now it's how do we bring people back? How do we make them feel safe? How do we create something new and different and engaging for them to want to come back? Which is a big reason why the title we're producing right now is such a huge draw is it's never been produced professionally. So it's a fresh title. It's a fresh piece of theater. It's at least for Parker, 60% plus of our cast, creative team, and designers are new to the Parker Arts stage, which is a huge deal. Um, So it is really like, in my humble opinion, humble or not, it's the freshest thing that people will see in Colorado this year. All right. Well, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you was why School of Rock is the first the first production. Yeah. Uh, so you touched on some of it, but uh, you know it's some it's a title a lot of people recognize. I mean, it was just a fantastic film with Jack Black, which is now twenty years old. It was two thousand three. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, what uh, well, I wonder why do you think it hasn't been produced professionally in, in Colorado? Has has the I'm sure the Broadway show must have come through the Buell at some point. Yes, but. Broadway's come through the Buell. Um, interestingly enough, you know the movie's twenty years old, but the musical is not. And um, licensing hasn't been available up until quite recently. Additionally, when people see this production, if they have any theater sense and wherewithal at all, they'll know how unbelievably challenging this title is. Um, (laughs) You've got two full bands on stage. You've got a pit band and the kids are actually playing instruments. Um, This was an interesting conversation with one of my creative team members who was helping with props and everything. And she said, well, if I give them drums, like it's going to make noise if it gets hit. And I was like, (laughs) and I, I was so confused by this statement. And, and I said, yes, she said, but we don't want it to make noise when it gets hit. And I was like, why? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she said well they're not playing are they and i said oh yes no they are actually playing these four instrumentalists on stage are actually playing at a very high level lead guitar bassist drums and keys and they are phenomenal and at the end of the show they're the only band playing because we've got the pit band as well and you would think it's a professional band in Colorado rock concert. It's unbelievable. So uh, it's a really challenging title just logistically with those two things from an audio perspective, finding the talent. Um, and then uh, the the vocal track for Dewey Finn is insane. It's, it's probably one of the hardest male vocal tracks in Broadway history. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, why he's why wearing- is that? He's wailing up there in tenor land almost the entire time. It's front loaded with this Mount Rock rock ballad, and it doesn't stop. It's uh-huh. that way the whole time. Additionally, Dewey Finn never leaves the stage. So he goes off stage and then he comes back on for another scene. So we've got people off stage managing, handing him props, changing his costumes, like all of these things happening. Um, the other interesting thing is if anybody goes on YouTube to to watch the Broadway bootleg, which of course nobody nobody does that, but it it, it is there. <laughs> um you'll notice that the scene changes are massive and they're fast. So we go from the hallway of Horace Green, the private school, into a full class private school classroom with a chalkboard and a uh, door and everything. But all of that is on hydraulics in New York City. Uh-huh. We don't have that here. <laughs> so uh, how do we effectively manage those transitions with these huge set pieces, making sure we have enough bodies and hands to manage that? And then our amazing director, Katie Reed, who has choreographed all of these changes beautifully. Some are happening in light, some are not. I mean, it's a beast of a, of a show. All right. Well, so Katie Reed, how did you uh, how did you pick her? Katie was an obvious choice. I mean, 
first of all, I met Katie at auditions for Nonsense at the end of 2021 <laughs> in Performance Now Theater Company. And Katie has a rich background. Um, she's She worked in New York City. She worked in Chicago. She actually was uh, part of the pilot program for MTI Junior Musicals to help like consult with those. She's been in education, high profile uh, theater education for a number of years and moved here five-ish years ago with her husband and actually lives in Parker as well, which is like, she's five minutes from my house. Okay. Um, But as we got to know each other, you know, she and I share a common, we really want to elevate Parker Arts. It's here. It's such a beautiful facility. How do we get involved? And Parker Arts opened the the RFP fall of 2022. I knew that I wanted Katie on the short list of directors. And when we found out that Parker Arts had chosen the title of School of Rock, which, by the way, they choose the season and their partners, approved partners, bid on producing these shows, I knew that Katie was the director for the show. Um, and I mentioned it to her. I was like, so <laughs> uh, how do you feel about this title? And she's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that that would be a good one to launch. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um so yeah, we've known each other for a couple of years. She's outstanding. Not only is she amazing leading this charge and she's super organized and has a, a very clear vision. She's an amazing performer. She herself is a Henry nominee and um has a, an extensive resume as an as a performing artist. So, it's pretty cool. We're lucky to All have right. her. Yeah. So, uh, so you had to go up against some other production companies and, and you won even as a new production company. How did, how did you pull that off? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. I'm just curious. I, I, I was really focused on what we could bring to the table that was going to be different and perhaps organized differently in a way that was tailored specifically to the show. So I started interviewing my creative team and gauging their interest well before we even won the bid for this. And knowing that I wanted Katie, she and I conversed at length about who we needed in seats for music direction, choreography, what we wanted the show to look like. So we had a very clear vision and bid to share with Parker Arts when that came up. So aside from contracting everybody prior to the bid going in, I had my whole team decided, and it was very easy for us to then say to Parker Arts, this is what we would do with the show and why and how we're going to get this done. So choosing Michael and Amy Pickering, who own Pickering Creative Artists Academy, a music studio, a theater studio, they teach private instrument, instrumental lessons, voice lessons, theater. That was like a no brainer selection. And they were stoked to do it. As like the music directors. Yes. Yes. And about half of the kids who are cast in this production are from the Pickering Academy. So they, they come with a lot of knowledge of great experience, good cultural fit, kind, studious, like supportive of everyone. Um, And then our choreographer works with Katie at um, Performing Arts Academy in Highlands Ranch. Choreographer is Madeline Schaefer. And again, New York tour credits, choreography, working with kids. And she's done an amazing job of creating this choreo that's that's digestible for a 10-year-old mind, but also really enjoyable for a soon to be 42 year old woman to watch who used to be a competitive dancer. So okay. yeah, it's really cool. We've got a great team. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so it sounds like you're really happy with the cast. Who's playing Dewey? Caleb Reed. Uh-huh. Caleb Reed. He's kind of like the Colorado grungy rocker musical theater guy. Um, he's uh-huh. the of ages. He was uh, in wedding singer. So that kind of track is like his, his, his shtick. Uh, He's really good at it. And frankly, I think Dewey Finn is probably one of the best roles for him because he's goofy. He's childlike in a way. He's rough around the edges, but he's so charismatic and lovable. 
which is what Katie wanted in a Dewey. Cause you know, the Jack Black Dewey is a little bit more of a jerk. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so some people are a huge Jack Black fans. Others are not. Um, Katie's not a huge Jack Black fan. And we didn't really want to pay homage to that persona. Mm-hmm. Um, and Caleb walked in and it was like, Psh, there he is. Um, Caleb and, and I had done shows together in uh, 2019. Yeah, two shows in 2019. We were in Newsies together at Parker Arts and then again, 9 to 5. And I knew he played guitar and I knew he, you know, has kind of this like funky rocker vibe thing going on. And I pinged him uh, early last year and just said, hey, just pay attention to auditions at Parker Arts later in the year. There's a show I think that you might be a good fit for. Uh Uh, But we had eight really solid Dewey candidates, like Really? really solid. It was crazy. We're so lucky. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you said that Parker Arts was like, we're doing School of Rock, and they put yeah. out the RFP. Um, if, so you do have a sales aspect to what you do as a production company. So uh, so are you going to pitch shows to other theaters uh, or, or you know, respond to ones where they, they actually ask for an RFP? Or are you going to go to, like, I don't know, Lone Tree Arts Center and say, hey, let's do, you know, this show? Um, there's the sky's the limit there. Uh, certainly we can have some influence and sway typically with the way that our, our business is structured. Companies will reach out to us and say like, what would your bid look like and how would you do it? Uh, whether that's an event, um, a musical, a play, a corporate event, something like that. We'll do any and all of the above, but mostly we're focused on musical theater. So, um, yeah, sure. We can, we can go to any of these large theater houses, Lone Tree is one you mentioned, and say, hey, can we do this? That would probably end up being a rental, which gets very expensive. Um, but should they need a producer or producing company to produce a, a show that they've selected and it fits our our core values and our, our code of ethics, then we would bid and ask to be in the ring. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And do you have anything lined up uh, that you can mention uh, after this? Yeah. Um, I can't get too specific about it, but uh, we will be producing a brand new, never before heard or seen musical written by a local composer. And that will probably be in early 2025. We're just working out um, rental arrangements and uh, getting all the casting and the workshopping in place because the show does need to be workshopped by the actors a bit. Uh, but the composer is has become a good friend of mine and has seen me on stage a few times. And I, I read I read the script and I was like, and typically I'm, I'm not that interested in new works, frankly, because they're hit or miss. But I was like, this is, this is really good. This is really engaging. This score is amazing. It sounds fully orchestrated. The story is great. Um, so that's our next known project. Uh, we will bid on the fall production at Parker Arts once that's announced and the RFP comes out for that one as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that, that's exciting. Uh, you, you've got you've got the thing up and running, and you're just about yeah. to open School of Rock this weekend. So it opens this. Is it Thursday night or Friday night? Friday night, the nineteenth. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and it and it runs through February tenth at seven thirty is our closing show. So four weekends. All right. All right. It's four weekends. The so School of Rock at the Parker um pace center and produced by veritas productions and, uh, and nancy nancy bagley and i you know i didn't get what is your uh actual title other than founder of veritas founder you... executive producer and managing director okay and your partner amy condon co-founder and artistic director so okay. and amy is also like a rock star with hair and makeup and costumes so she's doing a lot of the artistic look type things i can't braid hair like i don't know how to do that she's amazing me neither so, me neither <laughs> yeah she's she's very good at all that stuff which which really lends her skill set very well to the artistic side um and me much more to operations business money <laughs> uh-huh. core values hard conversations marketing all that all right well thanks so much for being on the onstage Colorado podcast, uh, Nancy Begley with Veritas Productions. Uh, break a leg. Best of luck with the, the show starting up this weekend. I will be there Friday night, so I'm looking forward to it. Rock on. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the School of Rock!
All right, that's it for this weekend's episode of the Onstage Colorado podcast. Thanks so much to Nancy Evans Bagley for telling us all about the new production company Veritas. And uh, again, School of Rock is out there if you can get tickets. I think that one's going to, it's it's a big hall that they're doing it in, but I think it's going to sell out, especially when a, a big show like that with a lot of community members in it is going to draw a lot of family and friends uh, filling up seats in addition to the regular mm-hmm. theater goers. So uh, definitely hop on that if you want to go. Um, and, uh, so next week we'll be back with more Colorado theater news, uh, as well as an interview that I did with, uh, Kate Kissingford. She is the, uh, one of the executive directors, artistic directors from Upstart Theater all the way down in Uray, a beautiful mountain town down near Telluride. Uh, and so they'll, they're going to be doing Heroes of the Fourth Turning, February 2nd through 5th at the historic Wright Opera House. Uh, we had a great conversation about how they started the theater down there and how they keep it going with uh, with high quality productions. And she, uh, she and her husband uh, run it down there and they've got a great background in theater. So, uh, yeah, definitely if it's a it's a bit of a hike, I think it's five or six hours to get down there. And of course, in the winter, maybe even longer, <laughs> if at all. Uh, so uh, but the, but they also do some Shakespeare in the summer. So uh, definitely check them out. Uh, and I know uh, we were uh, I mentioned we were going to have an interview with Josh Blanchard from uh, Colorado Creative Industries, and we will have that uh, just for, for timing with some of these shows. Uh, I just told Josh we were going to bump this out a little bit. So that'll be the week after to talk about uh, this this a and e centered arm of our state government and how it works with arts organizations around Colorado. So that's a great conversation that with I that I had with Josh. Uh, so stick around for that one in a couple of weeks. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Onstage Colorado podcast wherever you get your audio stuff. And give us a review or a couple of stars if you're enjoying this programming. And please let other theater lovers in your life know about us. Uh, I've had some nice comments from people, Tony, who say, uh, I ran into Julia Toby uh, the other night from Give Fire Productions. Mm-hmm. And I recognized her because I've seen her on stage. And I said, hi. And she and I was like, and she was like, oh, I recognize your voice. You're Alex Miller. Or uh, I was like, oh, I'm great. Like- you're listening to the podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, so wow, we've got, uh, yeah. We've got some we counted some fans in the wild. That's so yeah, fun. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. You know, we don't have tons of people listening, but we do. Uh, seems like a lot of the theater folks uh, like to listen to mm-hmm. listen to us. So thanks for joining. Uh, and also be sure to check out all the reviews, news, and other podcast episodes and our full statewide theater calendar on the website at onstagecolorado.com. So I'm Alex Miller, and I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll see you at the show. See you at the show. (laughs) 